morning, church. Turn to your neighbor, tell them good morning, give them a compliment. It's an honor to be seated beside you. Hallelujah. So we're excited about service this morning. So we'll move straight to our hymn, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Lord can wash away my sin. Make me whole or 
I say this to listen to the word of God today. The door of utterance has been opened unto us. And I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go. Walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God. And I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The word of God is food to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen and amen. All right, this morning we want to start uh, teaching a series on the subject um, of the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, the subject of the blood of Jesus Christ um, is one of the most important, right? In fact, not one. It is probably the most important subject that we have in the New Testament. For without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, there will be no Christian faith as we know it today. Uh, the defining point was when and where the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. Excuse me, there's an echo coming back to affect how I speak. All right. So what does the blood of Jesus speak to? The blood of Jesus speaks to the price that God was willing to pay for the souls of humanity. In other words, it tells us about the price that God himself was willing to pay for the souls of humanity. And in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, it tells us that for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement, right, for the soul. And in this teaching, I mean, as we go on, we'll come to understand what an atonement means. But it says that the life of the flesh is actually in the blood. And it says, I have given it to you upon the altar of sacrifice to make an atonement for your souls. And by that, he is saying to guarantee or to secure your life right in the flesh. But we look at the blood from uh, three dimensions. In other words, when it was sacrificed, it was sacrificed for God. There's a dimension of the blood of Jesus that is about God being satisfied by that sacrifice. There is a blood that works inside our own hearts. So towards us here, a work that the blood does within us. And then finally, how the blood works for us as we engage in a spiritual warfare to subdue the forces of darkness. But you have got to understand, all right, God's own estimate there on and of the blood of Jesus. For in Leviticus chapter 16, this atonement on the day of atonement, the animals or the animal whose blood was brought into the holiest of all was sacrificed or killed publicly. And every single person saw when, all right, and how the animal was killed and sacrificed. 
But the high priest was to take that blood alone by himself into the holiest of all, out of the reach of public eye, in all privacy, and offer it up honor to God. And therefore God accepted that blood and decided to walk in a certain way after the blood was received. We say in Leviticus 16 and verse 7 that the goats there were at the door of the tabernacle. And you shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. In the same way, Jesus was also sacrificed publicly in the open. But then when he was going to offer up his blood before the Father, nobody was there and it was offered up unto the Father, and the Father was satisfied, which meant he had to, first of all, receive it. Then in Leviticus, and there's an important thing here, we'll see this. In Leviticus 16 and verse 17, if we go down, it now says, And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation. Because if you don't understand God's own perspective, and his estimate of the blood and the attitude that he has developed towards you as an individual based on the blood of Jesus that was shed, you cannot fight spiritual warfare successfully. For you may think that when the collective is against you, God is against you. That's why he says that if God be for us, you must know where God stands. He says, who shall be against us? In other words, if God is standing for you, why is he standing for you even though you may have made a mistake? Do you get what we're saying? He says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect it is God that does what? Justifies. So he's saying that God himself, all right, has made a decision over you as a person and there is a way in which he relates with you because of the blood that has been shed on your behalf and you've got to understand that. So in Leviticus 16 and verse 17, all right, it says, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle, that means nobody was there. When he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place, until he comes out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household, which means it's between God and that person and the high priest, and for all the congregation. And after the atonement is now made, he now comes out. So no man goes in with him, and that was done, note this, once every year. It was solely between the high priest and God, and God therefore gets satisfied with the blood that was shed, and cleanses and forgives. So because God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus, he therefore says, I am in a position now to bestow mercy on humanity, not just because I am a merciful God, get this, but because the debt of the people has been paid. So I can only remain just in forgiving them. Do you get what I'm saying here? If you owe somebody 50 million naira and somebody else goes and pays on your behalf and says this is the money, this is the interest on that money, you no longer, all right, have any claim over that person because the debt has been paid. Are you following me, idea? All right? Now, the truth about the matter is... All right, God needed that so that he will remain just a 
paid him. So he was the one that arranged for the debt to be paid. Uh, you, you understand this? Which means in his mercy towards us, he arranged for that debt to be paid himself. But after the debt was now paid, he now said, listen, I remain just here in showing you mercy, provided your faith is not in your own works, but in the blood. You get what I'm saying? All right. So, Paul, I want us to understand this. Very important. So we see that the blood was primarily for God. God is satisfied with the debt that has been paid in full. And therefore he has accepted the blood. And this is his disposition towards humanity. He said, I have given you the word of reconciliation. He said, you see everybody that is on the streets. The Bible tells us. Jesus Christ died as a propitiation for our sins or a substitute. That was propitiation, that means. But not only for us, but for the whole world. In other words, every person in the world, even somebody who is out there and says, understand this, the debt has been paid. The debt hasn't only been paid for us that have accepted it. The debt has been paid for every single person. And our own message, therefore, is to go out there and say, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them, but saying that, listen, Jesus has paid the price for you to be free. Okay? That's all this here. So that's the message it tells us to go out and preach. In other words, it's a message that says the debt has been paid and Jesus, all right, is God is now at peace. Look, it's not that God, all right, okay, it's not that God is angry and then when you repent, all right, he now says, okay, that's not how it is. God, through the blood of Jesus, is now at peace with humanity. And he's saying, go and tell them. Go and tell them. All right? Not only have I died for their sins, Jesus, but look, they now have an opportunity for me to walk with them for the rest of their life and save them from any destruction. So a person now is totally rejecting the love that God extends towards humanity. Or maybe we're not preaching that. Okay? So God himself, all right, has been satisfied or is satisfied with the blood. And that's why you've got to understand that when you are in, in because what, if you are confused about God's attitude towards you, you will lose the battle. See, Isaiah 54 verse 15, you will, that's the battle will be lost. It says, behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. He says, surely people will gather. Do you get what I'm saying here? But he says, not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. This is where we now get the next verse that we like, we quote a lot. Behold, I've created all of these instruments, I've created a waster to destroy. Verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall do what? Prosper. In other words, the only reason why you know that it won't prosper is that God said, I didn't send anybody. Do you get what I'm saying here? So it says, when they gather, so you must understand that that thing must be embedded in your consciousness. Isaiah 50 and verse 7 to 10. Uh, Now. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I shall not be confounded. I have set my face like a flint. And this is an attitude you must have in warfare or else you'll be taken out. In other words, set your face as a flint. In other words, it is victory. We're here. There's no, this is it. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. Next verse. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. 
Now, not because of how well I am or how good I am, but because of the sacrifice I'm standing on. Are you following me? Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they shall wax old as a garment, and as moth shall eat them up. And we're going to look at this by the time we get to the end of the message that look. Okay? We'll, we'll see this. Let's just get it. Now, when we look at Exodus chapter 12 again, verse 13, we see this attitude of God that the blood was for him. He said, and the blood, when they shed the blood, shall be for you a token upon your houses where you are. And when I do what? See the blood. In other words, I'm the one that wants to see it. Do you get what I'm saying? You are indoors. Put the blood on the lintel. And when we get into this much, you'll see how important this is. Because he said, look, uh, um, um, you sacrifice the lamb, kill the lamb, pour the blood into a basin. He didn't say, if the lamb has been sacrificed in your house, it will pass, the plague will pass over. He didn't say, if you kill the lamb, he said, when I do what? See the blood. In other words, even if the sacrifice has been done in your house and you didn't obey the commandment of putting the blood on the lintel post there, on the doorpost and lintels there, you didn't apply the blood there, the angel of death will come in. Are you following what I'm saying? That's why the Jewish people tell a story and they say this, that the grandfather was a grandfather who was asleep and woke up and called his son. Have you gone to check? Did you put the blood? He said, yes, I put the blood. Go and check again. Because what God said is, when I see the blood. In other words, if I don't see, the sacrifice has been done. If I don't see it, as far as I'm concerned, you are a house of Egyptians. And many people are making that mistake of not directly applying the blood, all right, of Jesus there, all right, to things. So, the second one is, we'll still get into this, is for us. In other words, and the only way this can happen, and you know the high priest went and sprinkled the blood upon the message seat, and it tells us, so we also, in Hebrews chapter 10, now there's a work that the blood does in our hearts, which means the father received the blood, and the father said, well, I'm satisfied with this. Now there's a work that the blood does inside our own hearts. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, and this is where we can come, all right, let us draw near in a, in a, in a uh, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith. Uh, and that's full assurance is because we know we have peace with God. Having our hearts sprinkled from that evil conscience, in other words, a troubled conscience, all right, and our bodies washed with pure water here. Now, look, let me say this here. When they took the hiss up there and applied it to the doorpost, we're going to get into this situation. They literally were sprinkling that blood on the doorpost. See, it says, "When I see the blood," in other words, it says the blood was it here is sprinkled upon your heart. So what God is saying here is, whoever we see the blood in that person's heart at work, the demon moves back. It's not on a physical house now. Is the state of your own heart. Do you get what I'm saying? So you can have somebody who is in a crisis, and I'm telling you that's the end of it. If somebody is in a crisis and says that it's because of something that I must have done wrong, that's the end. Satan packs that person up because, because how do you pray when you think God is fighting you? Do you get what I'm saying? You must understand who the enemy is. So if that person's heart, there's condemnation in that person's heart, that person has that deep sense of guilt on the inside of them, then there's going to be, then God says, we haven't seen this. 
Finally, the scripture tells us that the blood also now is used as a weapon against Satan. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 here. And they overcame him, that's Satan now. The Bible tells us, I think it's the book of John. He says, I, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So here it says, they overcame him, and that's a sign of spiritual maturity, which means you know how to overcome, and in your own life, you have overcome, all right, the wicked one. Now, if you don't overcome forces of darkness, it will show in that they will frustrate you. For it tells us in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 22, that it tells us that, uh, sorry, verse 21, it says, and behold, the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And another scripture talking about that horn is in Daniel, I think it's 10 now. He says, and he wore out the saints, which means the saints started getting tired. You know, I couldn't, I, I, I won't try it in this place, but because I don't want to see it. But I went to preach somewhere, and there was a pastor that came before, <laughs> ahead, and he says that by word of knowledge, some people are looking for visa to travel. How many of you? The whole church. <laughs> I won't try to. Got up. Ha. Huh? The whole church got up. The pastor of that, which means you are preaching to people who have already, their bodies here, their hearts is in Atlanta. And London. So I went somewhere to preach a youth conference, read a massive youth conference. And Pastor Lincoln, the people got up and took the mic. He said, how many of you here want to jack by? Including the cameraman. He did like that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, are you two camera? No, it was almost like, ah, if you say prayer, let me not miss it. <laughs> the man on the, on the sound, everybody, I, I stood, I said, everybody. Now, I don't even think, maybe, Isha, in the history of the world, that. People want to leave a country, all right? I mean, it's, I can't, I, I, see, I mean, I was looking at something on the plane before I came. Statistics of how many Nigerians have gone to university in UK in the last three years, the growth rate is 868%. Listen to what I'm saying. The amount of Nigerians in the last 868%. <laughs> I said, who are we going to be left with in this country here? 65,800 and something students. That's, they say, horn. Do you get what I'm saying? When people start getting tired, there is a horn. And the Bible says that. So when we're talking about spiritual warfare, it's not something that uh, 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 is far. Huh? I said that because I'm going to say something before I anoint people. <laughs> and well, that's why it's not part of the message, but I went there. Because when I was praying, what should I anoint them for? God showed me. <laughs> no, it's not Jaguar. I don't, I don't, I don't do it. All right. <laughs> it's, not, it's not clean. It's not, you know, all right. If it's God's will for you to happen. If it's not God's will for you, may it not happen. Because if you go there, <laughs> uh, oh, you don't want, oh, so even if you're in disobedience, you want to go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me go back to the message. All right. So they overcame him by the blood. All right. Sorry. I'm, now let's put it up. All right. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the, I want to just share one thing here. It's very powerful. All right. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. I heard an old English evangelical say this. He said, when he says, love them in life unto death, he said, the people who are a real threat to Satan on this earth 
are people who have surrendered their will and life to God. Do you get what I'm saying here? That is, when we say death now, which means anything God asks you to do, you are willing to do it, no matter the sac- oh, you understand this. And most of these things here is commandments of love. For it says, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for it. And laying down his life there, he says that. Thank you, but Okay. Let me just put it here. All right. So he laid down his life, all right, for his friends. And the Bible says he poured his soul out unto death and made intercession. We're going to see this for transgressors there. Uh, Jesus said, listen, you have to carry your cross and follow me. He said, whosoever keeps his life, that's what he's talking about. He says, shall lose it. For whosoever loses his life for my sake, what he's going to gain is eternal life. So we'll see here, there is that attitude and disposition right, that you have towards God. And then he says, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, when you read it together, it says, by their personal testimony of what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for them. So you overcome Satan by your personal testimony of what the blood of Jesus has done. Now, I have it in my notes, but I, I'm not doing it because of the way the message went when I was preparing this message. What I had done was to get every New Testament scripture of what the blood has done. And then we were at this point in the service to make a confession collectively, but we'll do that next week. But, all right, is your personal testimony of what the blood of Jesus has done for us. So as you testify... As you confess, and that's why you have to know what the blood did before the Father, that you are able to say boldly there that God is for me. You are able to boldly say that, listen, no man can lay anything to the child. You are able to boldly say certain things the blood of Jesus Christ has done, all right, for us. Now, let's see something here about the blood. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3, just follow me in this, this is what I want to share. Bible says, in these last days he has spoken unto us by his son, who he hath appointed, all right, heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now look at this. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had purged himself, purged our sins, note that when he had purged our sins, the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Which means the work he did before he sat down was that he purged our sins and then sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now verse 13, it tells us this. Looking at warfare here, it says that uh, verse 13, Hebrews 1, 13. It says, To none of the angels said he at any time, all right, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. In other words, if we put those two scriptures together, after Jesus had purged our sins, this is why the blood is so key to victory. Purged our sins, he now said, sit at my right hand, and then said, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. You see there? So he purged the saints. He now said, sit at my right hand. He now goes, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Then we see this in Hebrews 10, verse 12 to verse 14. The secret to our victory is the blood that was shed. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. On the right hand of God, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. In other words, footstool there means Jesus is the head, we are the body, that he is waiting for every single member of the body of Christ to have total dominion in their lives over the forces of darkness. That God told Satan, you will bruise 
This woman's seed, all right, he shall bruise your head and you will bruise his feet. So the least member of the body of Christ will have, all right, almost on top of the head of Satan. Do you get what I'm saying? While we are seated there. Now, this is what I want to say. When he said seat, what is he sitting on? What he's sitting on is called the mercy seat. Now, follow this so you understand secret to dominion. Every high priest will go and offer up the sacrifice and sprinkle on the mercy seat, and God will say, you can now go. They will go, and every year they will come and offer up. When Jesus came and offered up, God said, no other sacrifice is required at no other time apart from this one sacrifice. I have accepted it. Sit on this mercy seat until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, please follow me now. We are seated together with Christ, where? In heavenly places. What we are sitting on is a mercy seat. Listen, if you violate mercy, Satan knocks you. In other words, that I forgave you, you must not walk in unforgiveness to any human being. This is why he says they love not their lives unto death. In other words, people did things and said, look, I am letting it go. It's an experience of death on the inside of me. That's why he says no greater love than this hath any man than to lay his life down for his brethren. That the person who will walk, we're going to see this in absolute authority, is that person that has been treated so badly, but yet they don't hold anything against anybody. This is why this teaching that came into Africa, broadcast on Nigeria, which means we curse our enemies, they must die when they do something, is to literally take yourself up the mercy seat. And once you take yourself off that mercy seat, then say, you are no longer far above. The Bible, uh, please don't pull that scripture. I knew that was a scripture. I was going to pull. All right, it says that, he that walketh in love keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Uh, put that there. It says, he keepeth himself. And then it says, and the wicked one, all right, toucheth him not. Then there's another one, there's that, in Jude. Let me just pull it out here. In Jude, there's another one here. All right? It says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. No, no. And the wicked one, all right, yeah, yeah, hold it there. Keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Now, go to Jude. That, now, I'm going to put it with another scripture. Jude, it says about mercy and about uh, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself on your most holy faith. Praying. All right. He says, verse 20, But beloved, building yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves where? In the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto what? Eternal life. Which means if you keep yourself in the love of God, and that scripture, you put that scripture up, it says, that man will have no occasion of what? Stumbling. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling. Which means we are sitting on that mercy seat. A person who is living by that law of mercy on this earth will be living in a realm of authority. A person who is living in that place of love will be operating in a place. And you can be operating by the law of mercy or can be operating by the law of judgment. He says he shall have mercy without judgment. So when something goes wrong and you are judgmental, he shall have mercy without judgment that has shown no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against what? Judgment. So we touched on that about the fact that it's the love of Jesus. Now, now let, let's just look at one last verse because I'm going to close with that. Hebrews chapter 10 here, verse 12 here. So, so anybody who's going to testify about the, law, about the blood of Jesus and overcome when they're testifying, that's why Jesus, 
must be operating in mercy. That's why Jesus said, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea. That's authority. He says, But when you stand praying, forgive. Do you see that? You can't operate in authority to move a mountain if there's unforgiveness in your heart, which means you are violating the law of mercy. You are not seated there. Uh, so many times we've just taken this sitting just to be confessing it. I'm seated together and people are wondering what's going on. Why is it not manifesting us? Do you get what I'm saying here? A, a person who is operating in that law, right, is operating in the spirit realm far above principles and parts. Do you get what I'm saying here? Even if they don't know the theology of we are sitting together with Christ Jesus in heavenly places, which means if Paul did not go to that place to teach in that church those scriptures, all you listened to was John who told you that walk in love, if you walk in love, you keep yourself, and that's what you know, you will technically be at the right hand of God far above all principles and powers. But if you are taught it and you understand it and the Greek word and can share it, but you are not operating in mercy, you will be there with it. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, please look at this here. Uh, Hebrews 10 here, 12. All right, so sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 13, he now says this. From henceforth, that his enemies be made his footstool. Now, look at the next verse. For by one offering he had perfected. Now, note that word perfected. Forever them that are sanctified. Now, let me bring this to a close here. So God accepted his sacrifice and said, I've accepted this. There's no more sacrifice. You can sit down now. All right, on this mercy seat. Anybody who is a member of your body will all be operating in mercy. Uh, are you following me? You'll be operating here in mercy. All right? That is where we are also seated, with him on that mercy seat. Ephesians 1.21 says, we are seated together from 20, verse 20, he says, verse 20, heaven whom wrought in Christ will raise from dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above, far above, all right, far above all principalities, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come, who is sitting right there. And, and it's your appreciation. I mean, God loved us. God first loved us so that we can go out and love. God showed us mercy. And we've got to understand what that sacrifice is. It means eternally will have been born in flames, regardless of anything you did on this earth. And he sent his son, and he says, somebody just said one unkind word. And literally what you are doing is to violate that covenant of blood that gave you that position. You've got to understand the price that is being paid for this. That will make you lose your authority. That will make you not be able to speak to things. On what? On the fact that she said this, he said that. Drop it. I showed, it's all, I'm telling you, it's only in Nigeria that they teach these things. And it's because it's, it's called, um, what's it called now? Um, T.S. Um, so what do you use in theological circles now? All right, is this um, what's it, what's it, it's, it's a terminology? All right, and it's almost like it came out. That many people's concept of spiritual warfare actually came out from the occult. So you know, I, I remember when we were in school, there's a woman that used to come to share. And she'd be sharing, and it started going around. Everybody was there calling her to share because she said she was deep into the occult. And this is how we used to do inside the occult. Now they're born again. Let me open you people's eyes to make you understand how warfare is so that you people will know how to pray. I, remember, I had very good spirituality. I said, don't go to that woman's meeting. It is not an occultic person that will teach the church on how to engage in warfare. It's the scriptures you will read. Are you following today? And everybody was calling her. And calling her, I says, "This is how warfare is. Ah, we stole this person's child. Everybody, hey, hey, hey. we stole this person. Yeah. You know what happened that day on express week? Hey, hey, hey. Until, unfortunately for her, I mean, nobody prayed that. 
She was in a terrible accident. The car was split in two. She died then. Then everybody left the doctrine. Because it is, doctrine doesn't come from experience. Doctrine comes from the word. Even if a person says, I went to heaven and came back, we're okay. We are not denying you went to heaven. But try, don't say anything you can't show us in scripture. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, because anybody can go to heaven and come back and say, let me tell you this in heaven, no. Women, no woman wears trousers in heaven. That isn't, uh, people should be shaking. It's true. It's true. I, like someone came back, and then I, I, saw, I saw six people in hell, strategic men of God. Strategic. <laughs> so you went to heaven and went to hell at the same time. <laughs> Who are you now? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody should be saying, ah, oh, yeah. So, I just want to close with just with this here. And then we'll do it and we are not. What does it mean, now literally here, what does it mean, now literally, to therefore take our position, seated together with Christ? How do you take this position in warfare to win? All right? Because we are seated far above principles and powers. And we overcome by our personal testimony of what the blood has done in that position there. Now, don't forget, what are you sitting on? Mercy seat. You, you understand? Now, in Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 17, now we know that armies gather together against... All right, Jehoshaphat in battle. And God, when he prayed, came and said, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves and stand still. The meaning of set yourselves is actually take your positions. You must be rightly positioned. Take up your positions and stand still and you shall see the salvation of the Lord, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow you will go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And tomorrow you will go down against them. Behold, they come by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And then he goes on and says in verse, in, all right, verse 18, I knew there was, all right. And Joshua bowed his head to the ground, and all Judah inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping him. And verse 19. And the Levites, all right. And the Levites and children of Kohathites, and children of the, all right, Kohathites again, stood up to praise the Lord of Israel with a loud voice on high. And the Levite, sorry, next verse here. And they rose up in the morning and went forth to the wilderness. And ye inhabitants, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you. And believe, prophet, so shall you prosper. Verse 21. The Bible says, now, he told them to take positions. That's what God said. But when they consulted with people, now what does it mean to take position? They appointed singers. Now look at the song they sang. Because you are taking your position. That they shall praise the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord for his what? Mercy. Now, you understand this? You are in a mercy seat. When you take that position, you are saying mercy. Do you get what I'm saying here? This is why God said, You come with one mouth, bless God for mercy. And the same mouth cause men who did you wrong. You are not positioned. You can't come and be singing because it's about the mercy. You can't be singing and at the same time somebody, which means that, that you are out of alignment. So it says, praise the Lord for his mercy and enduring forever. Now, we know the consequence of what happened there. The Bible says they all began to kill themselves and then they got to a place which is, and I'll show you this, which is far above all principles apart, which means it went beyond the expectation. For three days they were carrying spoils. They didn't have enough. They were carrying three days. Now, let me show you. How was God? God said, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He said that in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Or I put it there, he says to this man, right? 
after that, I sat down at the right hand of, of, of the God, expecting, all right, that his enemies, next verse, will make his footstool. Hebrews 1.13 says, he told Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, where did he get it from? So we understand. He got it from, the writer of Hebrews got it from Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. He said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, the next verse tells us how he was going to do it. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. Now, what's this rod of strength that he's sending out, all right, out of Zion? It tells us in, all right, Psalm 8 and verse 2. He says, out, when I consider the heavens, all right, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Now, so strength, and I'll show you this. So what does this strength mean? It means praise. For Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16, it tells us that, Matthew 21, 16, it says, for out, have you not heard, 21, 16, it says, have you not heard that out of the mouth, it is written that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Jesus said that, Matthew 21, 16, he said, all right, he didn't use the word strength. He says, and he said unto them, here is now what they say. Jesus said unto them, you have heard, have you not read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast what? Perfected praise. Now, perfected praise means, really what it means is, praising God for that perfect sacrifice. So he's saying out of it, he has perfected praise. Not just singing, but perfected praise has come out. And he's making reference to that. Now, and I'll close with this. This is what David saw. When David said, the Lord has given me a new song. That new song was that he looked at it and said, it is the song about the blood. That's what brought me out. That's what David was saying. He said, this thing is the song about the blood. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. We'll see this here as they sang. And then we'll look at David's own. And they sung a new song. And what was that new song? Say, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou was what? Slain. It was a song of the blood. And has redeemed us unto God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So in Psalm 40 and verse 1, let's see what David was saying. What David was saying was that, wait, wait, it's the song of the blood. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He said, he brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the merry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise. But what was the content of it? Remember, Joseph, they praised and said, for his mercy endureth. He says, many shall see it, the effect of this song, and shall fear and put their trust in the Lord. He now went on to explain what he learned. He says, blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. Respect not that the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Verse 5, many, O Lord, are thy wonderful works, thy thoughts, he says, cannot be numbered. I will declare and speak of them if they are more than numbered. Verse 6, he said, sacrifice and offering thou did not desire. Mine ear has thou opened. He said, burnt offering and sin offering has thou not required. He said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. Now, that's what he, he said. God put a new song. What was that song? He said, God opened my ears. Now, you want to see how deep David was? He said, he opened my ears and showed me that. Uh, it's all this burnt offering, sin offering that he was looking for. He said, and that was the song I sang to him. And he said, he brought my feet out of the merry clay and set it upon the rock to stay. Now, let's see what that song is. You see Hebrews chapter 10, that same Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 3. You see the build up to that place now. He says, but in those sacrifices, there was a remembrance of sin every year. Verse 4, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. 
Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice, an offering thou wouldest not, but a body you have prepared for me. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, thou hast no pleasure. Verse 7, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will. Verse 8, he says, and above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hath pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Verse 9, he says, lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will. He taketh away the first to establish the second. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 11, for every high priest standard daily ministering oftentimes and those sacrifices cannot take away sin. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 8, from henceforth expecting that his enemies be made. His word, footstool. In other words, if you are therefore singing that new song, and the song there came from a revelation you got that burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldest not. Therefore, what are you singing? You are singing about that perfect sacrifice, which means David long ago saw that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that will do that. Even before he shed his blood, he was singing about that blood and God brought his feet out of the Mary Claire and set it upon the rock. That's how deep David was. That's how deep David was. And the law the law of subduing enemies starts with praising. For he says in Psalm 81, let me tell you this, without praise, there can never be any victory in warfare, no matter how extended it is. See, some intercession that in, 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 sent me, in, I, can't read the, I can't read the testimony because it's a personal testimony. Somebody sent a lady and said, I fasted and I prayed about this thing. No change was going on in my life. He said, until I heard pastor talk about opening the gates. Then I realized the gates to my life were short. She said, I started praising God. Within one month, she listed everything. Even what she was not praising for came in. In other words, what she literally did was to open up the gates. And we are saying songs about the blood and the mercy of God that you are now singing back to him with that knowledge, all right, is what Satan cannot stand. And because this is what you are going to sing in worship to him, then you also from your own heart must obey. You know, the Bible says the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. And if that thing is sprinkled upon your heart, that voice is inside your heart. That's why it tells us the voice. It says, therefore, take heed to that voice. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 12 there, it says, listen to that voice. In other words, the voice of the blood is telling you, it's saying there, let go of this thing. Whose voice then shook? That's the voice of the blood. He says, let go of this thing. He's saying there. He's trying, telling you about it. And the reason why he's telling you all of this is that, look, this is where the whole of your authority is. I can bring you out of any situation you are in in your life, provided, provided you operate in the law of what? Mercy. That's why Joseph could never have become prime minister of nowhere, sitting at that right hand there, technically, if he hadn't forgiven his brothers. And let me tell you, the depth of forgiveness you have to do shows how great you are. You hear what I said? Huh? If you are going to do mighty things, you'll be treated very badly by people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me repeat what I'm saying. You cannot lead the people who have, let me put it this way, who have not dealt with you first. You hear what I said? Not that the exact people, but, but generally speaking. Because that is your proof of total commitment to the people. There is no other proof of commitment unless you, for, that's, why, that's why marriage is a journey of forgiveness. You know this seminar, the secret of marriage is what? Forgiveness. The reason is this. Whoever you are in the public is who you are in the public. Who you are in private is your spouse and us. Anything wrong with you, they are the first to know. 
If your tongue is caustic, they know. If you do hands-on management, they know. If you, I mean, somebody came to report somebody to me that the person, I couldn't believe it. The person, the person literally, I mean, how can I say it now? Let's see. This is not what happened. This five about it's internet now. Everybody, just take it. Everybody's hearing what you're saying. Let's say the person literally, not not this is not what happened, but let's just say this person breaks bottle on the wife's head. Uh, not exactly, but it's something like that. It's something very close to that. And when I looked at the chap, I could not believe. Chen to guy. Chen to. <laughs> Listen to me. Interacting with me is like a dove. I, I looked. Do you know? I've not been able to talk to the person because I can't reconcile what is going on. So it is the wife that knows. So when you are getting married, God says, you are the sacrificial lamb I have been, I have been looking for all these days to help me purify this person. All right? You know, we've been looking for good that we can pour the sin on and then you help me carry the sin out of the world. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why. So anything wrong, pour it on you. You wasn't react to. He was making intercession for the word. It says love covers a multitude of sins. He says only you must know. Be praying. And then you are there interceding, praying. God says, this is my work. Next time you speak to your business, it will respond. Because you have performed your priesthood properly. And then when they ask what's the secret to your success, they say, only God knows. <laughs> <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying here? That's what it begins. That's why he says that you might present without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. In other words, in marriage, is a place of purification. Are you following what I'm saying? Here? And if you're married, when you get to heaven, it's your partner God used to judge you first. Not church. You can believe make a bull in the church, make a bull, make a bull. If you get home and the make a bull stops in church, but at home, let me warn you, this head of yours, let me have been telling you when you get to heaven, make a bull cancelled. <laughs> you say, but I cast out demons. You say, you are, you are walking in iniquity. How do you reconcile that? In other words, the first assignment I give you is in your house. The child did something wrong. Instead of you operating in mercy, and knowing what to intercede over the life of that child next. You say, you can't make it. You, as you are. <laughs> the child almost have to confess. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? <laughs> uh, you understand this? And that's why it says you love not your life unto what? Death. Yeah. And, and the person who begins to pray and begins to intercede that way, they, they, has, they, they just find they begin to operate at an authority level that is very, all right, very high. So it's about, all right, it just start here, it's about first thing here because Judah goes first. It's about songs about God's mercy over your life, songs about the blood, all right, of Jesus and the mercy of God over your life. And than the other things. So before I pray over people, I will ask that um, you folks have the anointing on. Okay, it's here. All right. So I'll ask that, where's the worship? They told you? You've been informed. All right. So we'll take a song about the blood of Jesus, and then I'll come and read out a scripture, all right, that I want to use in, in anointed here.